Hello, everyone. Um, this is Barbara Cochran. I'm back from Florida in back to cold Seattle. And um, I am very pleased to introduce the Jerry series lecture for today. Um, I'm the associate director for the Northwest Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Center. Our mission, if I can advance the slide. Um, is to optimize primary care um, of older adults. And we uh, hope to do this um, and engage families, caregivers, age and dementia friendly health systems, as well as primary care providers and their communities to support older adult health and well being. And we um, have objectives that include transforming clinical environments to be integrated age friendly systems that practice the 4M. Some of you who have heard these lectures, this term um, know now about the 4Ms, but just to let you know or remind you that the 4Ms um, of age-friendly systems include what matters. Um, in other words, what matters to the patient? Um, what are their preferences for their care? Medication, and we're gonna have a very important lecture on medication today mentation, um, as well as mobility. The four M's should be addressed at L every healthcare encounter. Our lecture set schedule is here. The lecture today is focused on the beers criteria and specifically prescribing quality in older adults. Um, and so you can see that much of that lecture is going to focus on medication, but also what matters and a bit on mentation as well. Next. Um, week, we will be having um, a lecture on non-pharmacologic pain control where um, we'll get into a little bit more about um, what matters and mentation that don't involve medications necessarily. Our um, lectures are on site. Uh, we have um, faculty from the Northwest GWEC on site during the presentations and we are monitoring the Zoom chat function during the presentation. During the presentation, we're focusing mostly on technical issues, but we'll open up the chat during the last 15 minutes so that you can pose questions to the presenter. Um, and just a reminder to please be sure and complete the forms, a profile forms form for each series, a sign in or some sort of attendance monitoring for each lecture attended, and an evaluation form, which is critical for us to be able to make decisions about subsequent lecture series. Please check with your site coordinator regarding the format. Some people are doing these um, forms on hard copy and others are accessing them online via SurveyMonkey or something like that. Post lecture considerations, just a reminder, you can get up to 15 um, contact hours um, for healthcare professionals, nurses, social workers, counselors, psychologists, and as well as the, um, for family physicians. Uh, you'll have more information about requesting continuing education contact hours at the end of the series. The recordings of these lectures are posted within about 48 hours of the live lecture on our Northwest gwec.org website um, and actually you can through that website access um, over 90 other lectures that have been um, delivered for past series and should you so desire or someone you know want to get continuing education credit after this series the ones that are posted on our website are not available for continuing education credit but our uw continuing nursing education offers these lectures for online continuing education credit after the series is over. And there's a link here to the uwcne.org website to be able to do that. Um, and today I'm very, very happy to introduce Dr. Zachary Markham, who's an assistant professor at the UW School of Pharmacy. And he is also the um, associate director um, I'm trying to remember the title with the Pline oh, Center. The Associate Director for Research with the Pline Center for Geriatric Pharmacy Education Research um, and Outreach. Thank you. I don't have my introduction here with me. Um, he has done several of our lectures focusing on deprescribing and other kinds of considerations. A great resource for geriatric pharmacy um, considerations, and I'm very pleased to introduce him and have him talk with you today about prescribing quality in older adults. <laughs> 
Alrighty. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, so, like Barb mentioned, I'm a faculty member here at the school. I've been here for five years, and most of my time is spent doing clinical research on topics related to medication use in older adults, so this very topic. So this is something that I'm very passionate about, um, and I'm happy to speak with you about it today and to answer any of your questions at the end. So I wanna make sure that we do have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, I am going to try something a little bit technologically brave today and try to use SurveyMonkey for some crowd participation. And so if you do have a cell phone or a laptop or a PC that you're viewing this lecture on um, and you're interested in participating, you can just simply click on or type in the hyperlinks that show up on the slides to participate and we'll see how that goes. If not, we can just roll with it. So before I get started, I wanted to list some disclosures. So I do receive grant support from the National Institutes on Health, specifically the National Institute on Aging and the CDC. I'm a faculty mentor for a couple of our fellows who get training in health econ and outcomes research, and that is sponsored by Genentech. And some of these slides were courteously shared by my colleague, Holly Holmes, who's a geriatrician in Texas. So the talk today is divided into three main sections or objectives. We'll start by briefly going over some of the um, components of prescribing quality in older adults. We won't spend a whole lot of time on that. We'll spend the majority of the time on objectives two and three. Um, so the Beers criteria, and oftentimes when we identify a drug that's listed in the Beers criteria, the next logical step is to consider deprescribing. And so I wanted to end with that. But kind of a, a underlying objective that runs throughout all of this is that I'd like to introduce you to some key resources that you might use in the future. Um, there's only so much we can cover today in this short period of time. And so hopefully you'll have a chance to um, look at these resources after today and ideally use them in whatever setting you're in. So section one is prescribing quality. And like I mentioned, we're gonna try something here. So if you're able to enter in this hyperlink, I'd like to get your thoughts on what is the biggest barrier, in your opinion, to prescribing for older adults? There are many, so there's no right answer, wrong answer. I'm just curious where you're coming from on this topic. There's, oh no, I don't need to show the results. I just wanna, I can speak them. So it looks like we have some results. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and read so everyone can hear what people are saying. So one person said compliance or adherence, which is a good one, cost, time, understanding their difference between acute and chronic pain, safety of medications, dosing correctly and adjusting appropriately. It's definitely uh, important um, when it comes to renal sort of changes that might occur compromised organ function, so again, kidney, liver, et cetera, the number of existing medications they're on, polypharmacy, access, polypharmacy, and time. So these are excellent. Thank you so much for participating. I really appreciate it, and I'm glad that that worked. So let's go back. So it sounds like you all are right on it in terms of identifying barriers. And again, the, the main point here is that there are many and they're very patient specific. And so just to kind of start, um, I think this is all known to us, but I think a picture is worth a thousand words and this picture here is quite powerful. So you see the age categories on the X axis 
increasing. And then on the y-axis is the percentage of people with a certain number of drugs. And so as the color gets redder, the number of drugs increases. And you can see there's a nice correlation here between increasing age and increasing number of drugs. Now these data are from 2010, as you can see, and they're also from Scotland. Um, the situation in the United States is probably even worse in terms of older adults using more medications in the United States. And so it's widely known that older adults are the greatest consumers of medications. And this is largely due to the fact that as we age, we accumulate chronic conditions or otherwise known as multimorbidity. One of the responses from the survey question was polypharmacy. And this is what we typically think of when we think of polypharmacy from the prescriber's view, right? There's a medication list, anywhere from five to 25 different medications, different dosage forms can be very overwhelming. I think it's also important to keep in mind what this might look like from the patient's perspective. So when we're looking at a medication list in the clinic, either before or after the visit, I think it's important to keep in mind what exactly are we asking the patient to do in their home, in their day-to-day -day life? Because I don't know about you, but this would be very overwhelming for me. And I um, arguably have my cognition intact and you know, have, you know, I'm able to move around and go to the pharmacy and that sort of thing. So this would be very overwhelming. So just keep that in mind when you think of polypharmacy. It's more than just a number. Um, it's actually a day-to-day -day experience. And so we're really talking about a paradox here with medications. On one hand, they're probably the single most important healthcare technology in terms of preventing illness and disability. But on the other hand, anytime an older adult presents with a new symptom, we should first be thinking about a medication side effect. That should rise to the top of our differential um, and until it can be ruled out. And so it's this love-hate relationship with medications in older adults. We need them because oftentimes they can work and they can work well, but in certain scenarios and in certain patients given certain conditions, we can run into trouble. And so we talk about medication related problems as this catch all composite term, which is basically when anything with medication therapy goes wrong. And we care about this because they're common and they're associated with all of the bad things that we're trying to prevent morbidity, mortality, and unnecessary healthcare cost. So just take a minute um, briefly to think about, can you come up with an example of a medication related problem in an older adult? And you don't need to submit any questions in the chat function, but just think in, in your head about a medication related problem. And you yourself may have even experienced one. These are not hard to think of. So here are the three categories with some examples. So this basically represents everything that can go wrong with medication therapy. There can be underuse, meaning the older adult has a condition, but they're not receiving evidence-based medication. So for example, an older adult with osteoporosis who does not have any contraindications but is not on a bisphosphonate, that would be classified as underuse. Overuse is when the older adult is receiving more medications that are clinically indicated. So here an example could be insulin plus a sulfonylurea. There's really no therapeutic reason for that combination because the sulfonylurea is working the same way as the insulin is essentially. And so that would be classified as overuse. And then the third category is inappropriate use. And we're gonna spend the majority of today talking about inappropriate use. And this is defined as when there's a medication where the risk outweighs the benefits. So one example here is benzodiazepines being used for insomnia in older adults. So in general, the risk outweighs the benefit and actually the gold standard of care should be non-pharmacological interventions, behavioral interventions for insomnia. Um, but we know that despite that, a lot of older adults do still um, receive medications for insomnia. One other point is that medication related problems in these different categories can exist in the same patient. So for example, someone could have underuse and inappropriate use, the same patient. Um, so that's, there's a lot of kind of overlap and um, complexity that goes on. So like I said, we're gonna focus on inappropriate medication use. 
And this is important again because it increases morbidity, mortality, and risk of adverse drug events. Um, it's increasing over time as our population is aging. And it's common, but importantly, we can do something about it. So some of this is preventable or modifiable, and we'll talk about ways to do that. So I asked you what were some of the barriers to um, prescribing in older adults, and I think this slide, which is the risk factors for medication problems, kind of talks about some of the same things that you all said in your responses. So just to kind of highlight a couple unique ones, as we age, our body changes. So for example, we, our total body water decreases, which increases the percentage of our body that's made of fat. And so for a drug like diazepam, which hangs around in the fat a long time, the same dose in an older adult compared to a younger adult is gonna hang around for much longer. And when it hangs around, it increases the risk for side effects, like sedation falls. So the changes that actually occur in the physical body um, can have an impact on drug side effects. You mentioned multiple illnesses and multiple medications, multiple prescribers and pharmacies. Um, sometimes we don't do a good job of actually identifying that there's a medication related problem. So that can simply be an issue. Um, hopefully this lecture series is getting at this one here, the lack of health professional expertise. So we're doing our, our best to spread the word, um, but still on a national level, we have very few people um, who are actually trained in geriatrics. So this is an ongoing issue. Several of you mentioned lack of time. That's certainly um, the most precious resource in the clinical setting. So I think as a pharmacist, this is an opportunity for um, you know, maybe non-physicians to step in and help um, manage some of these issues that take a little bit more time that don't fit within the 15 minute clinic visit. Some of you mentioned patient non-adherence. So you might advise the patient that they're supposed to stop their insulin, but for whatever reason, they continue to use it, you know, and that would be classified as patient non-adherence. And then limited evidence. So even though older adults have the most conditions, use the most drugs, there is this paradoxical issue that we face where older adults are not included in clinical trials. And so the evidence that is used in the guidelines is not representative of the older adult who's sitting in front of you in clinic. So there's this huge evidence gap that we always struggle with. So that was section one. Like I said, we go through that pretty quickly. Um, we're gonna move to section two now where we focus on the beers criteria, which is one way to measure inappropriate medication use in older adults. So these are formally known as the AGS beers criteria. So the American Geriatric Society, and they took over the beers criteria um, a couple iterations ago. And when they did, <laughs> They really added some rigor and robustness to the, the process by which these criteria are agreed upon. And they put a lot of effort into making them useful as educational tools. So the Beers criteria have really come to life since the AGS took them on. Um, the Beers criteria were originally developed in 1991 and they were only specific for the nursing home setting. So now they apply to all care settings um, and it's 2020, so they still live on. So this is the tweet that went out January 31st of 2019 of the AGS announcing the Beers criteria. So they've been out, this most recent version has been out now for about one year. And they plan to update them every three years or so. So they review all the literature that's come out in the meantime, and then they come up with an updated list. So you might be thinking, Beer's criteria, why are they named that? Um, it's not named after a beverage. It's actually named after a person, um, Mark Beers, who was a um, pioneer in geriatrics. And this was actually his fellowship project back in 1991, I mentioned in the nursing home setting. So he developed them, they're his namesake. So the intent of the Beer's criteria, there are many goals. Um, most obviously, they're meant to improve the care of older adults by reducing exposure to PIMS, which are potentially inappropriate medications. 
So sometimes you'll hear people talk about PIM use or it's potentially inappropriate medications. I mentioned they can also be used as an educational tool. They are routinely used as a quality measure and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. And then people like myself who do geriatrics research can use them to say measuring, you know, the prevalence of beers criteria drugs in Medicare Part D in the association with hospitalization or whatever. So people use them in research settings. And there's always this tension between their use in a prescribing fashion in the clinical setting one-on-one -on -one, versus their use in a, as a quality measure. And we'll talk about that here in more detail. So when we think about prescribing quality, we're thinking about a person in front of us, right? A patient that we're caring for. So when they're used in that way, it's very patient-centered. You're incorporating the patient's goals, and there's a lot of tolerance for deviation from evidence-based medicine guidelines, right? So the guidelines are telling you this, but you know this patient in front of you and their goals, and therefore you're not going to change a beer's criteria drug, for example. You might keep them on it for whatever reason. So there's a tolerance for some deviation from what you're, quote, supposed to do. Versus a quality performance measure, which is population-centered. So now we're talking about thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. So think about Medicare, right? They're gonna measure the extent of use of these drugs. So they can be used to benchmark goals. So you can say, you know, in the state of Washington, 23% of older adults received at least one PIM, potentially inappropriate medication. And then you can do, you know, a different initiative or pass a different policy and see how that rate changes, how that prevalence changes. Here there's less tolerance for deviation from the guidelines because you really don't have that clinical, that one-on-one -on -one perspective. You don't know the patient goals because you're typically looking at claims, medical claims. So you're very far removed from the point of care. And so the Beers criteria can be used in both of these settings, but there's this ongoing tension. So a, a individual prescriber might get a letter saying, hey, your patient, Mrs. Smith, is on a Beers drug, and they kind of get hounded and, and dinged sometimes for that. And then the prescriber pushes back and say, hey, well, you don't know my patient. These, I have valid reasons for that, right? So that's the tension that I'm describing. So I think anytime we talk about the Beers criteria, it's important to keep in mind that they're just one piece of the puzzle. And the puzzle is quality prescribing. So quality prescribing includes a lot of different things. And I've intentionally listed inappropriate drugs down here in the middle, just to hit home the point that it's just one, one piece. So what we're talking about today, you know, is great, but it's just one of the aspects of quality prescribing. You still need the correct drug for the right diagnosis. Some of you mentioned appropriate dose based on comorbidity. So a patient with CKD, for example, drug-drug interactions, um, avoiding overuse. We hear a lot about overuse of antibiotics, especially in the nursing home setting, avoiding withdrawal effects, and then considerations of cost. So this all goes in to what we would call high quality prescribing. So let's take a little bit of a deep, deeper dive into how the Beers criteria can be used for quality measures. So you've probably heard of the Medicare star ratings, I'm assuming. If, if not, these are um, used to rate different health plans. So it's basically like a quality measure, kind of like a Yelp review, if you will. Um, and they, there are several different categories. And so say an older adult wants to sign up for a prescription drug plan or a PDP, they'd come to a web page like this and say they're shopping. You know, of course, they would want the one with the highest quality. Who doesn't? So you come and you see their overall star rating. And then you would go in a little bit further and you could see this line down here with the arrows. It says plan members 65 and older who received prescriptions for certain drugs with a high risk of side effects when there may be safer drug choices. That's a long way of saying a Beers drug. So the, the Beers drugs are actually what is populated into this measure. And this particular plan got one star out of five, so that's not good for them. So that would mean that this plan had high use. 
of the beer's drugs. So what do we mean when we talk about the beer's criteria? Well, it's actually now a lot of things. Um, and I've listed here the specific tables in the article, if you're interested in going to the beer's criteria to read them in more detail. So most traditionally, it's table two, and that is the PIMS, the potentially inappropriate medications that we typically try to avoid in most older adults. In addition for table three, it's what we call drug disease interactions. So in a given patient um, with a certain condition, say dementia, what are the drugs that we'd want to avoid because those drugs worsen that condition? And we'll um, go through a couple examples. Another drug disease interaction could be a patient with a history of falling or fracturing and a benzo, a benzodiazepine, right? And the logic here is that it could worsen their condition. There's also this table four drugs to use with caution. Typically these are some newer drugs that have come out for which the evidence is not fully known or understood yet. So it's kind of a holding table. There's also drug drug interactions and drug dosage adjustment based on kidney function. Now these are certainly not comprehensive because that would be a very large table. These are what the committee thought to be the most clinically relevant drug drug interactions and renal adjustments for older adults. And I'm not gonna go through all of them. I'll just direct you to the actual article if you're interested in um, using them or reading more about them. There are additional tables. There's table seven, which is a list of drugs with strong anticholinerg anticholinergic properties. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then there's just kind of these organizational tables um, outlining the changes that have happened. And I'm gonna go through some of the highlights of those um, so you can see what's new in the 2019 criteria. So to start with, the medications that were removed since 2015. So previously, there was this criteria that said, you shouldn't use medications that lower the seizure threshold in older adults with chronic seizures. It's pretty intuitive. Um, they've removed this because this is not unique to older adults. This is something we should be doing for all patients. So they really are trying hard to make the Beers criteria unique and specific to older adults. In addition, H2 blockers, so things like ranitidine or Zantec, used to be advised to not use in older adults with dementia because there were concerns about worsening cognitive impairment. However, they revisited the evidence and they determined that it was weak. And they also knew that there's this restriction in the Beers criteria on the chronic use of PPIs. And so they thought, well, we're kind of leaving people with no option, right? If you have an older adult with dementia who has GERD symptoms, we're basically telling them to not use ranitidine and to not use a PPI. So, so they took the H2 blocker criteria away. So now, according to the Beers criteria, that would be acceptable to use an H2 blocker in an older adult with dementia who has GERD symptoms. So it's a little bit confusing, but they basically wanted to give clinicians an option that was supported um, by the most updated evidence. And then finally, aripiprazole um, or Abilify in PD. So it had previously been listed as a preferred antipsychotic in older adults with Parkinson's disease. Um, it's since been removed due to safety concerns and limited efficacy. And so if you're familiar with the treatment of Parkinson's disease psychosis, um, you'll recognize that these are the drugs that are typically used um, for that scenario. I will say the evidence here is not very strong at all. Um, it's pretty weak, but these are the ones that are used and that have the most evidence. So clozapine, of course, we need to be careful for the agranulocytosis. That drug, it's, it's kind of high maintenance in terms of monitoring. Pimavanserin, which is the newest one, and then quetiapine. So medications added. So they've added a sulfonylurea clomeparide. The concern, of course, is severe prolonged hypoglycemia. They've added SNRIs in older adults with a history of falls and fractures. And that would be, again, what we'd call a drug disease interaction. And the reason is that SNRIs, like venlafaxine, for example, um, or Effexor, increase the risk of falling and fracturing. So we would want to try to minimize that risk. This is a tricky 
spot because SSRIs and TCAs, tricyclic antidepressants and SSRIs are already listed in, under this drug disease interaction. So now basically all of the treatments for depression are listed here. And this is very tricky because depression itself is a risk factor for falls. And so you have this competing risk of depression with the risk of falling again that is very tricky to manage clinically, but it's one I think that really is just a risk benefit sort of situation and a shared decision-making opportunity with the older adult. You know, you would not, of course, want to let the depression go untreated, um, but it's this balance between using the, the lowest effective dose, I would say, of some of these drugs until we get further evidence to guide us. And then some drugs to use with caution, rivaroxaban due to bleeding risk, Tramadol, not really a great drug to use in older adults in general. Dextromethorphan quinidine, probably won't see this used very much. It's, the brand name is Nudexta. Um, so not great e efficacy and increased risk of falls. And then Bactrim, um, specifically when used with an ACE inhibitor like lisinopril or an ARB like Losartan in patients with reduced kidney function. That scenario is basically a perfect storm for hyperkalemia. And then the modifications. So there were some that were removed, some that were added, and then some that were tweaked or modified. So previously, the beer's criteria said no sliding scale insulin because it doesn't help control glycemia and it just increases the risk. Well, now they've modified it to say that it's okay to use sliding scale insulin, but only in older adults who also have basal or long acting insulin on board. So you should not be using sliding scale insulin alone. Um, typically, the people ran into trouble in the nursing home setting when, where this was done. Um, and so now we just need to be make, making sure that patient actually has some long-acting insulin that's on board. And then this one here, you probably saw last year in the news, there was a lot about aspirin from some large clinical trials for primary prevention. So it was not found to be, have a net benefit when used for primary prevention in older adults. So this age criteria used to be 80, and so it was lowered down to 70 and above. So basically you wanna use caution in um, older adults 70 and above aspirin for primary prevention. This does not apply to secondary prevention. The Beers criteria are wonderful for a lot of reasons, one of which is that they give you these caveats, I think, kind of add some clinical context. So it's not um, so kind of absolute. So they, you know, here's a couple examples. So patients enrolled in palliative or hospice care are excluded, right? Because we're not, at, at that point, we're more focused on symptom control and a lot of these drugs would be highly appropriate to use. So how do we use these clinically? I think it's important to remember that the Beers criteria are not a list of contraindicated drugs. And contraindication means something very specific in pharmacy and in medicine. It means that you should not be using the drug, right? So I think the Beers criteria should instead be viewed as a warning light to stop and ask yourself, why is the patient taking it? Is it truly needed? Are there safer and ideally more effective treatments available? Does this patient sitting in front of me have any characteristics that increase or mitigate the risk of this medication? So do they have, you know, have they fallen seven times in the past year? And therefore I'm really worried about their fall risk, right? So taking in, into account the patient characteristics, ideally this sort of thinking would take place at the time of the initial prescription and that follow-up. And this last point here I think is, um, intuitive, but a lot of times I think when we're busy, we can kind of default to say, oh, well, this person probably started it for a good reason. I'm not going to rock the boat. I'm not going to do anything today. Um, and so a lot of clinical inertia or prescribing inertia happens. And so I would just challenge us all to not do that and to kind of stop and think and, and maybe just ask a question, you know, why is the patient on this? Do they still need it? So you hear anticholinergic drugs mentioned a lot in geriatrics, and in turn, you see them a lot throughout the Beers criteria. And so I just wanted to walk you through 
where they appear in the beers criteria. So this is table two, kind of the bread and butter table of the PIMS. So you see them here, the first generation antihistamines, the rationale for why they're high risk, recommendation, quality of the evidence and the strength of the recommendation. So there's the first time that the anticholinergics appear. You also see them in the table three, which is the drug disease interactions. So here we have delirium, dementia or cognitive impairment, and so on. So the anticholinergics show up again. And then I mentioned this before, but table seven here is a nice concise list of drugs with strong anticholinergic properties. And I think, you know, if you ever look up a side effect um, profile of a drug, chances are it's gonna say something about an anticholinergic side effect. So it, it becomes a little bit confusing, like which ones are clinically important. Well, I think this table here is a nice list of those that have the strongest anticholinergic properties. So if you'd ever wanna think about the ones you'd wanna worry about the most, it would be these here. So patient case, we'll just walk through this kind of quickly. So we have HK, an 88 year old male reporting to the ED due to a fall at home admitted to the medical unit. Past medical history, dementia, anxiety, hypertension. Current meds, dinepazil for um, dementia, paroxetine for anxiety, and zolpatem. Um, we're not sure why, but we can assume for insomnia, but there's no documented reason. And there's a note that's passed that says patient takes the zolpidem at home for sleep and would like it or an equivalent to be ordered. So once you have the beers criteria kind of, kind of in the front of your mind, this is what would come to mind, of course. So you'd say, oh, paroxetine is on the beers criteria. It um, is one that should be recommended to be avoided because it's highly anticholinergic. Among the SSRIs, it is the one by far that has the most anticholinergic properties non-benzodiazepine hypnotics, so that would be the Zolpidem. Those are also listed as drugs to avoid. And then we have a couple of drug disease interactions. So our patient has dementia. So dementia in the presence of Zolpidem is not a good thing. This patient also is presenting with a fall. And so using Zolpidem and paroxetine in a patient like that is also a drug disease interaction. So we have a lot here in this kind of simple case. So the first thing, you know, once we recognize all the issues, then we need to kind of prioritize, given the patient's goals of care, to identify our first step. Um, we'd want to then coordinate close follow-up to ensure the treatment plan is enacted, making sure everyone is on the same page. Um, and so in this specific example, right, you're probably not going to have enough time in the inpatient setting to get the patient tapered off of the paroxetine, um, that could take weeks, but you could at least raise the idea, communicate a plan that you're concerned to the outpatient setting. Um, and at the very least in the inpatient setting, you could avoid giving the patient Zolpidem because that could potentially worsen his fall risk um, and try to think about some other things. And so I know we have an interdisciplinary audience and I'm sure you all could help me complete this slide um, even more, but some nursing interventions, right? The nurse is, the face um, is one-on-one -on -one with the patient. They're hearing exactly what the patient is requesting and, and complaining about. Um, so the nurse knowing the beer's criteria, hears that the patient's asking for a sleeping pill, knows that the patient was admitted for falls, and so could communicate some alternatives um, to the team. PTOT might notice, you know, that this patient given <clears throat> the use of Zolpidem at home and Proxetine, that maybe they're overly sedated. And so during therapy, the patient's falling asleep. That information could be useful as a sign of over sedation. And then social work um, could coordinate and contact a family and caregiver, um, say that there is kind of a plan to um, deprescribe the Proxetine. That could be a little bit of a complicated plan in terms of reducing the dose and increasing the dose of something else. So making sure that the patient has kind of the support system to do something that's complicated like that. So of course the topic today is medications, but I, I always think it's important to keep in mind that there are things other than medications. So we do have some non-pharmacological sleep options that do have some evidence to support them. So this is one picture of a non-farm sleep protocol that has been used successfully 
Um, and there's some other ones that have been tested. Now, for um, this is not a surprise to many of us, but the evidence for non-farm interventions for sleep are, of course, not very strong. Um, so we need more research in this space um, because we, what we do know is that the drugs we have are risky for our older adults. Um, we just don't always have great options um, as replacements. So taking a step back from that case, we're talking about PIMS now in general. So what, what interventions have been used to reduce them? Um, education, of course, has been used. Um, that's usually not sufficient on its own. Usually needs to be paired with something else. If you're lucky enough to be a part of a geriatric medicine service, those have been shown to reduce PIM use. Pharmacists um, have, shown, have been shown to be able to reduce PIM use. Computerized support systems, so say you're going in to order something, you order diphenhydramine, computer pops up with a message saying, hey, this is a high risk for X, Y, and Z reason. Are you sure you want this? So things like that. And then regulation or health policy. So if you do go and pull the beers criteria, I would highly recommend that you um, also read this article, which is an accompanying editorial. It talks about how to use the beers criteria. I won't go through all of these, but I think it's important to keep in mind these key principles. Um, one, that these are potentially inappropriate. That's the P and the PIM, right? Potentially inappropriate, not contraindicated, not absolute. Um, and then at the very bottom here, just these are the American criteria. So these don't apply to other countries, but other countries do have their own equivalents. A lot in Europe do, um, and a lot in Asia have come up with similar sorts of lists. We can think of many challenges. I'm sure you, if you've worked with these before, you know some of these challenges. Sometimes families um, are very resistant to change if the patient's been on a drug for a certain period of time. Um, yeah, we've talked about some of these before. So in conclusion, Beer's criteria should be used with clinical judgment and common sense. Keep in mind those key principles and use resources and direct your patients to them as well. So now just take a moment to think about a scenario that maybe you've had, or if you haven't had it, maybe you can think of one on the fly, where your clinical judgment would supersede the Beers criteria. Meaning, I'm gonna allow the patient to use this drug, even though it's on the Beers criteria. Okay, so one example that you may have thought of could be something like Benadryl, right, diphenhydramine in the setting of anaphylaxis, right? You're not going to not give someone Benadryl because it's on the beers list, because they, they absolutely need that in that setting. Um, a more kind of nuanced example could be something like a patient who has a history of suicidal ideation and a history of fracturing and is on sertraline, right, an S SRI. Right, so we know the patient that's a drug disease interaction with the SSRI and the history of fracturing, but we really are worried about their depression, right? Given their history. And so, you know, we're, we're not going to not use the SSRI in that setting. So again, just, I think it's always helpful to think about what the beers criteria are not. That helps you get, get a perspective on what they are, I think. Okay, and then one final question about the beers criteria. We're back to SurveyMonkey. So if you could go to this hyperlink here and complete this question. Which of the following medications is not on the beers criteria? Diphenhydramine, loratadine, 
paroxetine or zolpidem? A couple hints that you've already received. Okay. Looks like we've had five responses so far. Okay, so most people are saying loratadine, which is the correct answer. Um, someone said diphenhydramine. So diphenhydramine is on the beer's criteria as a highly anticholinergic um, antihistamine. Paroxetine, we talked about, highly anticholinergic SSRI, and Zolpidem is a non-benzodiazepine hypnotic. So thank you for participating in that. And now, back to our slides. So now we're on the third section. Um, we're gonna wrap up here in next, 15 minutes or so. Um, so we've done a good job now of identifying drugs that are, quote, high risk. So now what do we do? So there's this, not new, but the term is, is new in the field, deep prescribing. Um, and it is defined as listed. It's quite a complicated definition, but I think it's important to kind of walk through and um, dissect it. So it's a systematic process of identifying and discontinuing or reducing the dose, because you so you could either stop or just lower the dose in instances in which existing or potential, so they may not even have manifested yet, harms outweigh existing or potential benefits. And then this is where it gets really complicated. Within the context of an individual patient's care goals, current level of functioning, life expectancy, values, and preferences. So that's asking a lot of you to take all of that into account when you make a single decision. Um, I think, of course, this is all important. I think the take home message here is that this is not simple and this is not done in a single encounter. You, you know, you would need to have developed a relationship with the patient, develop trust, know how to communicate with them, um, know what their goals are, understand their prognosis and all of that. Um, so this is not easy to do. So here's one of those resources I mentioned. Um, this just came out uh, January 21st. So if you have access to up to date, there is now for the first time a chapter on deep prescribing. And this was written by um, a colleague, Mike Seinman and Emily Reeve, and they are two of the leaders in deep prescribing. And it's very well written. It's comprehensive, but it's not super, super long. So it's a great resource if you ever wanted to learn more about the evidence, um, communication strategies, or how to start a conversation, that sort of thing. So we can think about deprescribing in a couple different scenarios. When there are clear harms, and here we're worried about a potential adverse effect. So thinking about the beers drugs, for example, Secondly, we can consider deprescribing when there's uncertain benefits. So if a patient has, you know, 12 conditions and 25 drugs, what is, what's the benefit of that 25th drug, really? Um, and so if it's, it's really complicated and we're not sure what the benefit's going to be, then that could be an opportunity for deprescribing. Life-limiting or debilitating illness, um, that's certainly a time to think about deprescribing or if the patient changes their goals and care. So say a patient is um, you know, at the end of their life and they really don't wanna care so much about their A1C anymore. So it's more of a quality of life issue at that point. 
So you could probably consider deprescribing some of their diabetes drugs, for example, at that point. You would also want to consider deprescribing if you detect what's called a prescribing cascade. And if you're not familiar with this concept, it is um, where there's a drug that leads to a side effect that's not detected as, as such, it's misinterpreted as a new condition that's then treated with another drug and so on and so on. And so you can think of some examples. One that I always think of is an NSAID, say being used for pain, it can cause hypertension and then someone could receive say an antihypertensive. So that would be an example of a prescribing cascade. Now these oftentimes go missed. So if you're able to detect one of these, that would be a time to deprescribe the original offending drug, and you might have an opportunity to then deprescribe the subsequent drugs. So how do we think about this? How do we start? So the first step is essentially medication reconciliation. So get all the drugs that the patient's taking and the reasons. Then you wanna consider the overall risk of drug-induced harm in the patient. To, to come up with, you know, how urgent is this, right? Is this patient immediately at risk or is this something that can be assessed at, at follow-up? So you wanna try to get a sense of the overall risk. Then you wanna think about for each drug, whether or not it can be discontinued, prioritize, you can't do everything in one visit. Um, so start with what matters and then go ahead and implement your plan. This article came out late last year in the uh, JAGS, Journal of the American Geriatric Society, and it actually focused on older adults with frailty um, and uh, limited life, but I think the ideas actually apply to all older, older adults. And it's this idea of um, how do I think about being a deep prescriber? How can I become a deep prescriber? And so it goes from kind of broad down to very specific, and we'll go through each of these. So the first thing you can do is use a model or a framework, and there are several of these currently available. Um, and this is really kind of an approach sort of framework. So it's a way of thinking about um, goals of care, time to benefit, life expectancy, clinical status. Um, and so that might just be something that you think about on kind of a more global level across your patient panel. Then you get a little bit more specific and you think about the medication list that's in front of you. And so here you're thinking about whether any of these medications can actually be deprescribed. And then again, you would prioritize and think about which ones you should tackle first. And then you get down to the nitty gritty and you have to, this is where the rubber meets the road, you have to actually do something. You have to deprescribe. So you, you pick a drug, pick a tool, use an algorithm, and I'll show you some examples of what these might look like. Um, so again, it's kind of starting from the broad, thinking about a model or a framework, you know, how can you wrap your mind around this? Um, cause it does, it's kind of a different way of thinking. Typically we're used to starting things, right? The whole medical system, whole FDA approval process is built upon starting drugs. Um, so this is kind of a shift in our thinking, get down to the medication list and then get down to the actual deep prescribing. So here are some tools. There are many of these that are coming out on an ongoing basis. This is a, this is a very active area right now. Um, and I'll show you in more detail on the next slide an example. But there are groups in Canada, Australia, um, Tasmania, Europe, Ireland, the US, just had a deprescribing network that was funded by the National Institute on Aging. Um, so that has just launched. So we now have a US deprescribing network. And so each of these units is kind of putting out resources and tools. And so you can expect more of this sort of stuff to come. But I would say the leader in this field has definitely been deprescribing.org, which is led by the Canadian Deprescribe Network, otherwise known as CADEN, C-A-D-E-N. And if you're interested in using any of these resources, um, I would recommend you go check it out because it, there are things here for patients, providers, um, there are specific algorithms. Um, they just keep generating more and more every month. 
they also keep you up to date on the publications if you're interested in um, the evidence behind them. So this is a screenshot of one of their deprescribing algorithms, and this is for antihyperglycemics. So this is the sort of visual that they all look like. It's kind of nice and user friendly, um, detailed with not being too detailed. Yep, so this is available on deprescribing.org along with many others. They have them for antipsychotics, um, PPIs, benzos, they have a variety of them. So like the Beers criteria, there are barriers of course here. So it's an unclear patient population, right? So like I mentioned before, um, we're very used to starting things and typically we start things based on guidelines, right? So you have your guidelines for osteoporosis. So you know if a patient has a diagnosis of osteoporosis, these guidelines apply to them. Deprescribing is a little bit less clear. We don't know exactly who we're talking about. Oftentimes patients can have psychological connections with medications, and so you can be met with a lot of resistance. Um, patients can react in the sense of, oh, you're taking care away from me. Why are you giving up on me? that sort of thing. For certain medications, there actually can be a physiological withdrawal that we need to be aware of. So benzos are probably the best example. We um, should not just immediately stop them. We need to slowly taper. Time has been mentioned a few times now as a barrier, and it certainly is the case here. This is not an easy process. It takes time. And then the evidence while accumulating is still um, quite limited. So this is probably one of the best studies that's come out in deprescribing and good for them. They focus on the hardest drugs to deprescribe, benzos. So this is the Canadian group. Uh, Kara Tannenbaum is the leader there. This is the EMPOWER study. And the intervention here was quite simple. It was a direct to patient educational brochure to kind of create this, um, discordance in their mind to kind of nudge them to deprescribe. And so patients were recruited, older adults were recruited from community pharmacies in Canada, and they were given this pamphlet that you see here. And these patients were identified as taking one of these drugs long-term. So they received this educational packet about the risks of benzos, and then it actually included a detailed tapering off program. And that was it. So you wouldn't think that would do much, right? But in fact, it did. So 27% in the intervention group stopped the benzo compared to 5% in the, 5 in the control group. So it was a very effective kind of low-touch intervention. Another question you might ask yourself is, well, do older adults want to do this? Do they want to stop their meds? So Emily Reeve, who I mentioned is one of the authors of the up-to-date chapter, she led this paper here, which was a nationally representative survey of Medicare beneficiaries. And I just want to draw your attention to the top two lines. So the top line is, if my doctor said it was possible, I'd be willing to stop one or more of my regular medicines. 90% agreed or strongly agreed with that. And then the second line is, I would like to reduce the number of medicines I'm taking. Two thirds agreed or strongly agreed with that. So the take home point here is that yes, older adults are interested in reducing their medications. So I mentioned conceptual models a little bit earlier and the fact that there are several. This is just one example and I think um, it's a nice visual and it's comprehensive, which I like. And the point here is that it puts the patient at the center and it adds these layers of context through which the patient lives their life. So you have your physical um, context. So we're talking about meds here. So, you know, do they have a hard time swallowing the pills? Are they too big? Hard time opening the pill bottles, financial, social, you know, who's supporting them? Um, are, are they the ones who are going to the pharmacy? Um, psychological and then clinical, meaning their actual conditions. And so we'll go through these kind of quickly, but 
These are just some example questions that you could ask yourself in each of those domains as it relates to deprescribing. So for the clinical, are there any medications that are important for the patient to take for clinical benefit? Of course, we'd want those to be on board. And what about harms? Those are the ones we'd consider for deprescribing. For psychological, what are the patient's beliefs and understanding about the, their medications? Have they previously asked about reducing or stopping meds? That might be kind of an opportunity to build off of that ask. Social, are there any other partners that need to be involved in the deprescribing process? Who's the gatekeeper as it relates to meds? Anything about finances? And then physical, does the patient have a high pill burden? Are there any physical barriers that are getting in the way? And then for the patient, in terms of clinical, are there any medications that are really important to you? And if so, why are they important? That question can be very enlightening. Um, because what you think is important, the patient most likely does not think is their number one important um, medication. What are the main reasons for taking your medicines? That can get at some of the goals of care. How does your family feel about your medicines? That can get at some of those social aspects. Are you worried about the cost? And um, do you feel burdened by your medications? So that is a nice, um, they call it the deep prescribing rainbow. It came out couple years ago, I think it's nice to give you kind of some categories through which you can think um, about some of the questions you might ask patients. And then you can imagine that with this, as with most things in healthcare, communication is critical. Um, the context is really important. There's a lot of negotiation that has to happen, both with the patient as well as with other providers. Say you're the primary care um, provider versus you know, the specialist and the specialist is the one who started the drug. So, you know, it can be tricky to navigate that. Um, this paper here just talks about some of the communication strategies. Um, and I think it's important to understand that not all deprescribing is created equal. So stopping omeprazole is very different than stopping oxycodone, right? And it could require completely different strategies, monitoring, et cetera. So to wrap up with one last research slide and to give myself as a pharmacist a pat on the back, please excuse me. Um, this is also from the Canadian group. This is their most recent work, which was an extension of the Empower study that I mentioned before. So basically they took Empower and they built upon it. So they went from just sedative hypnotics to also including gliburide, which is a sulfonylurea that has a high risk of hypoglycemia, first generation antihistamines, we're worried there about anticholinergics, and NSAIDs. So they basically picked four of those Beers drugs and they had the pharmacist give the brochure to the patient and the pharmacist sent a, essentially an order um, sheet to the provider as well. So it was a triangulation of the patient, the pharmacist, and the provider. The pharmacist, making the recommendations to the provider um, and kind of spelling it out for them. This is exactly what we think could happen. It was based, you know, it was backed by evidence. It was very clear, easy to follow. And so with that intervention in mind, again, these were community pharmacies in Canada. Um, they were successful. 43% of the intervention group stopped um, any of the meds that are listed there versus 12% in the control group. So this was again, very encouraging evidence for deprescribing interventions of some of these risky meds in older adults. And so I'll just end with one more survey question, um, and maybe we can just roll into the Zoom chat if that's easier. Um, what is one way that you can implement a deprescribing principle in your clinical practice? And it depends a lot on your setting, right? If you're in an area um, where patients have low, you know, socioeconomic status, then cost might be the biggest thing. Um, so this is very setting specific. <laughs>
Okay. Oops. So that's what we covered today. Thank you all for coming along with me on this journey. Hopefully you now are um, aware of some new resources that might be out there. Um, and like I said, deprescribing is a fast moving field right now. So I would anticipate more and more to come out about this. Um, and so I thank you for your time and attention and I'm happy, looks like we have plenty of time for questions. So I'll repeat questions yeah. that have come across Still pop and mute. Um, how are insurance companies using beers criteria to develop coverage formularies? Somebody needs to turn their speaker off over there. Great question. Do I need to repeat that or did they hear that? They got it. Okay. So that's a great question. Just going to go back. I skipped over this, but um, so the key principles that I talked about before the beers criteria, number six says access to medications included in the AGS beers criteria should not be excessively restricted by prior authorization and or health plan coverage policies, meaning formularies. So basically what happened was historically health insurance companies were doing this. They were restricting them. And of course that gets in the way of clinical practice, you know, Again, we're not saying that you can never use these and that health, the health insurance companies were interpreting it that way. So the AGS has gone to great lengths over the past several years to put this messaging out that, that these drugs should not be restricted in the ways um, that, were, that were asked about. Is there a list of PIM for herbal supplements and vitamins? <laughs> I'm muted, other than... I can repeat it. Okay. So is, is there a list of PIMS for herbal supplements and vitamins? Great question. So is there a list of PIMS for herbal supplements and vitamins? The simple answer is no. Um, I would say the... I would say another question is, what is the evidence for herbal supplements and vitamins in older adults? And to date, it's very limited. Um, there are, of course, cultural context in which we need to navigate through this. Certain people, you know, um, approach Western medicine and Eastern medicine differently. So we need to be um, respectful of of people's use of some of these products, but um, the current evidence is, is, you know, unless there's a deficiency of a certain vitamin, um, they're really not adding much in terms of health outcomes. And I always um, get nervous when older adults are spending their money on those rather than some of the prescription drugs that have good outcomes like statins, for example. Um, so if that's the case, then I get, that's when I care the most. But otherwise, um, you know, if, if people want to use them, that's fine. But I think it's just important to be aware that the evidence is not super strong um, for improving health outcomes in older adults um, from the herbal supplements and the vitamins. Yeah. First, first of all, that definition about deprescribing is fabulous. Yeah. I'm a social worker. Yeah. So that last section was really meaningful to me. But um, I, I was. I didn't understand the last empower um, uh, study that you that you cited. I didn't understand the point the point that you made. What what uh, the pharmacist to the clinician? Yeah. Okay. So the question was about the deprescribed trial here. So the question was, could you clarify the interaction between the pharmacist and the um, primary care physician? Sure. So they gave what was called they developed for each of these drugs what's called a pharmaceutical opinion, basically kind of like an order set. So they would, they would send, say, one for gliburide, and it would have the evidence that says at the top, gliburide increases the risk of hypoglycemia in older adults with the citations, you know, because clinicians want to know, like, where is this coming from? And then it says, we recommend 
stopping glyburide in this patient, the patient's name, we recommend you know, some alternative or whatever. So it was a very kind of a, a clear, actionable thing for the prescriber to basically just approve or not. I wasn't understanding the, the purpose. Yes. It's the physician that doesn't necessarily want to be prescribed. Correct. So that's a great point. The purpose of this is based on Empower. They actually learned that one of the main reasons that people, so that it was successful, but one of the main reasons that people did not deprescribed their benzo was because the clinician is actually telling them not to. So they, they identified that as a barrier, which led to the development of this. And so they, they really um, tried to target both the patient and the prescriber with the pharmacist as kind of the, the captain. Yep. I have a question actually related to that. Do you yeah. have a sense of just out in the community, to what extent pharmacists are aware of the beer's criteria and might um, identify for the patient or contact the doctor? Yeah, so the question was, in the community, how likely is it that pharmacists are aware of the beer's criteria and might contact the doctor? Now, as someone who teaches a geriatrics pharmacy elective, I would like to think that a lot of them are, but I realize that these are just our students who are in our certificate and get specialized training. The majority of pharmacists um, are probably not, unfortunately, aware of the beers criteria, um, unless they're doing geriatrics related specialty work. Um, the way that the pharmacists might know about them is that they might get some sort of messaging from the health insurance company letting them know that this is a high risk, it's called high risk medication in the elderly or HRME. That they might not be aware that it's coming from the beers criteria, but that's where they might interact with it. But I, it's hard for me to say. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So kind of bounce off of that last question. How do you see a community pharmacist role in this deprescribing and medication barrier management when there is limited time? Yeah. Oh, such a great question. Yeah. So the question was about the potential role of expanding the community pharmacist to deliver some of these activities loosely um, termed medication therapy management or MTM, which comes from Medicare Part D lingo, um, more specifically deprescribing um, in the setting of limited time, which is so challenging. So yeah, I mean, I think what we need, and there's actually a big push right now for Medicare to recognize pharmacists as providers. So we need to, a total rehaul of the system because an individual pharmacist cannot do this. They're not incentivized to do this, right? They're incentivized to fill prescriptions and generate revenue, unfortunately, for the company. Um, and so if we can change the policy at a national level to restructure the system, you know, then the pharmacist can behave in a way in which they're incentivized, um, which could be for some of these clinical activities, I think that we're gonna make a difference. So it's, it's a really good question. And our school in particular is really um, at the table trying to have this discussion um, to move the field forward. Any other questions? questions? Oh, great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Very clear. Thanks.